starts right now. A massive jump in cases at the Bear County Sheriff's Office. More than a dozen employees now testing positive for COVID-19. The update coming within the last hour. And we already saw a jump in cases as a whole here in Bear County. Tonight we stand at 665 confirmed cases in Bear County. That's 50 more than yesterday. Those cases include a VIA bus driver, a SAWS employee, several HEB employees, five San Antonio police officers, and now 16 Bear County Sheriff's employees. 11 of those cases are from a class of detention cadets who had graduated recently. They had all been placed on leave after the first member of the class tested positive. The Sheriff's Office does not believe any additional detention officers are affected. Meanwhile, the Sheriff's Office is dealing with an inmate who tested positive at the jail. It's the first inmate to test positive for COVID-19 at the jail and is isolated. The Sheriff's Office says none of the other inmates housed with the patient have shown symptoms, but they're taking precautions if symptoms arise. We're separating them out into smaller groups. We are taking their temperatures uh, twice each day uh, to make sure that we're not going to develop another case. And we're requiring all of them to wear masks. And we will do that for the, for the next uh, 14 days. The sheriff's office is requesting all inmates housed in the affected units be tested. We're also hearing about concerns at call centers in San Antonio. Our KSAT web team actually learned two call centers had positive cases of COVID-19. A spokesperson for Coles confirmed the West Side call center on Rogers Run did have at least one case, but didn't specify how many. In a statement, the company says that there was a deep cleaning of the work area and all common spaces and added extra measures. That facility is currently open. Wells Fargo confirmed two employees at their contact center on Wiseman Boulevard tested positive. The company says they also conducted a deep cleaning and asked employees who were close to the two employees to not go into the office. The city has stated call centers may operate, but should practice social distancing. Now let's take a look at the breakdown in cases here in Bear County. Out of the 665 cases, 92 have recovered and four more people are in the hospital tonight for a total of 89 people in the hospital. Unfortunately, 24 patients have now died, which is an increase of two since yesterday. And those added two deaths are from the Southeast Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. The Southeast Side facility was the site of a coronavirus outbreak. That's right, and the news comes as the city announces two other nursing facilities were chosen to isolate nursing home residents who tested positive for COVID-19, but it seems this is only for future patients, not residents who are at the Southside facility. The night team is Stephen Cavazos with an update tonight. Stephen. Steve Jaffney, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf said residents at the Southeast Side nursing homes will actually be staying where they're at. He says these two facilities were actually chosen to prevent another outbreak from happening. He says they were chosen by their owners. The East Side River City Care Center and West Over Hills Rehabilitation and Healthcare were chosen as those locations. During today's daily briefing, Mayor Ron Nirenberg said managers of nursing homes in the region helped to select those facilities that could potentially be used to house nursing home residents who test positive for the virus. He did add those nursing homes are currently empty. About 50 residents from River City were moved out of that facility earlier this week. Bear County Commissioner Tommy Calvert expressed his frustration over River City being selected as one of those facilities, given its location is dense in a densely populated area. The commissioner released this updated statement this evening, saying, quote, the owners of the facilities proposed this plan because it was best for them. Our government could have proposed they go to the former hospital on the Lexington, the former Nick's Behavioral Hospital on Babcock, the Coliseum, empty hotels, or an area in a rural environment, end quote. Judge Nelson Wolf reacting to the commissioner's frustration during today's daily briefing. I don't blame him for being frustrated. Uh, Nobody wants to take care of people like this. Nobody wants them in their neighborhood. Uh, but that was not a decision we made. Uh, we are weighing in on where we want them to go, and we want them to go to West Over Hills. We think that's the best facility. Now, both the mayor and judge said over 100 rooms are available at West Over Hills right now. It's unclear how many rooms are available at River City. Now, it is important to know that both Mayor Ron Nirenberg and the judge said that they hope neither facility will have to be used. But if so, it will likely be West Over Hills first because it's still relatively new. We have more on the story at KSAT.com. Reporting live, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Steve Jaffney. 
Thank you, Stephen. It's also worth mentioning that the city is also using designated hotel space to help with COVID-19 patients who are having trouble self-isolating away from family or friends in the household. Those who would need help in finding a space to isolate are being directed to call the Metro Health Hotline. The number on your screen right there, it is 210-507-5779. And as more and more people are out of a job during this coronavirus pandemic, the San Antonio Food Bank says they've seen the need double in the community. Before COVID-19, CEO Eric Cooper says they were serving around 60,000 people per week. Now they have seen 120,000 people per week. And during yesterday's food distribution at Traders Village, an alarming 10,000 people showed up for food. That is 4,000 more than the pre-registered people they were expecting. If we don't get some type of intervention um, from FEMA or the state of Texas, um, I, I know we're, we're, we're going to run out of food. I mean, we just don't have enough to meet this, this new um, demand. Cooper said they are expecting assistance from the federal government to be here by the summertime. In the meantime, he said that they will have to either ration off food or rely on philanthropy. Next Friday, another mega food distribution is scheduled at the Alamo Dome. Pre-registration is required. Let's take a quick look at our surrounding counties and the numbers they're reporting tonight. Numbers of COVID-19 cases increasing in many of those counties. Many of them are now in double digits. Comal County now reporting 37 cases. Hayes is at 79 cases. Guadalupe County has 47 cases. Wilson County hit 10 cases today along with Medina County. Kendall County also at 10 cases. Bandera and Gillespie counties remain at one case each. We've got a night beat update now. The San Antonio couple stranded in Peru because of coronavirus back at home, but they're now under mandatory self quarantine. This is because of Texas Governor Greg Abbott's executive order mandating a two week quarantine for travelers entering Texas from locations with the biggest COVID-19 outbreaks. Tiffany Huertas tells us what their experience has been like and how the state is still keeping track of them. I have my my mom and my sister. They they go to HEV. They they buy our groceries and they just live at the garage store. And These days, Jose Hinojosa and Siul Cortez are not leaving their house because they are in mandatory self-quarantine. Last month, the couple got engaged in Peru. We spoke to them then as they were looking for ways to leave the country. Due to the coronavirus, the country closed its borders. When we couldn't uh, leave Peru, I contacted the embassy, so they just took our information, email, phone number, passport numbers. After being stranded for two weeks in the South American country, the couple received a call from the U.S. Embassy in Peru on March 30th with good news. We got a call from the embassy saying that we, we had a, a, a airplane uh, confirmation. Before we got into the airport, uh, they had a doctor checking our, our temperature. The couple left the next day, had a connecting flight from Miami to Austin, and arrived in Texas on April 1st. When we got to Austin, Texas, they made us sign a form where he's saying that uh, you had to be in quarantine at your house for 14 days. Jose says a special agent with the Criminal Investigations Division at the Texas Department of Public Safety even came to check on them. Do you want to make sure that we are here? that we're following the quarantine. DPS says those who are under mandatory self-quarantine must go directly from the airport to their quarantine location, remain in quarantine for a period of 14 days, only leave the quarantine location if they need to seek medical care or to leave Texas. Those under self-quarantine are not allowed to have visitors and DPS can conduct unannounced visits. For now, the couple continues planning their wedding, but Inojosa believes things will never be the same. I just think that uh, uh, life is not going back to normal after all this. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. New on the night beat, a wild story. Two restaurant managers, a cook and a friend, accused of setting up a fake robbery at the restaurant they work for. Universal City Police say it started with a robbery report from a manager at the wing stop, but the story seemed fishy from the start. The 19's Patty Santos tells us through this investigation, one of the suspects admitted to another crime. His story just didn't make sense because they didn't call us for almost 30 minutes after the incident occurred. Universal City Police say Wingstop General Manager Christopher Gossas claims he was in the middle of the parking lot with the store's deposit bag on Monday, March 30th, when he was robbed. He was hit by someone, 
they ran away with the money. With the help of surveillance cameras around the restaurant on Pat Booker Road near 1604, police quickly uncovered the alleged conspiracy. Police records show Gasas, another manager, Jesus Soto Salazar, and lead cook Ludmark Etienne, as well as his roommate Devin Watson, were arrested and charged for conspiracy to commit a crime. Can't really discuss everything that the camera shows, but it definitely uh, paints the picture as to what actually happened. But that's not all. During the investigation, police say one of the suspects spilled the beans on a second alleged crime. It was actually the night prior the group conspired to go over and uh, break into the ATM, which was uh, information given from the other manager that we picked up last. Um, he noticed that the ATM was open when and got with the group, told him about it and they decided let's go to this ATM. Police say between all four, they face about 14 felony charges for robbery and attempted break-in of the ATM. And because we're in a state of emergency, police say anyone committing a similar type of crime could face additional charges. The restaurant manager on duty Friday declined to comment on the arrests. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. All right, there's a look at radar. We don't have much activity out there right now. Most of it's far northwest of San Antonio on that I-10 corridor just outside of our viewing area. But we did have a little shower that popped up north of Del Rio and basically came in from Mexico earlier this evening. That's it. Otherwise, temperatures for the most part sitting right around 70 degrees. And I think we'll wake up to readings in the low 60s come tomorrow morning. There's a look at that radar again. Just a few little showers otherwise. 74, that was our high temperature today after a low of 65. Right now, 60s to right around 70. And I got some new information from NASA today that I'm going to share with you. This is the average nitrogen dioxide in the air for the northeastern U.S. in March. Wait till we compare this to this recent March during the shutdown. That and our storm forecast, which includes some activity this weekend coming up. Interesting. Thank you, Adam. Still ahead on the night beat. How are our local vulnerable communities being impacted when it comes to COVID-19? Your questions answered coming up. And we're taking a look at the pandemic week by week here in Bear County. The numbers we're now seeing in the latest week of the pandemic and how they compare to others. And we're going to take you to a local memorial site created in response to the pandemic. It's next on the Night Beat. A 50 foot memorial cross has been raised at Mission Park Funeral Chapels and Cemetery South. Mission Park says it's a way to honor all the people who have lost the fight against COVID-19. 24 people have since died from the disease. The monument will remain in its place from here on out to give people a place to pay their respects and reflect on this time. Speaking of reflecting, the cases continue to rise. The latest line graph showing the growth since our first case was announced on March 13th. Four weeks later, we're at 665 confirmed cases in Bear County. So how have these cases progressed week to week? Last week, Metro Health loosened criteria to allow more testing. The amount of testing differs from our first week when we saw 29 cases. Week two saw 91 cases. Third week, Bear County confirmed 222 cases. This week, 323 tests came back positive. It's also the first full week since testing restrictions were loosened. Statewide Texas is now reporting more than 11,600 cases and 226 deaths. The state estimating that more than 1,300 patients have recovered. Cases across the state are still going up, but giving an update on the Texas COVID-19 response today, Governor Greg Abbott signaled that he is already thinking of strategically reopening Texas. Next week I will be providing uh, an executive order talking about what will be done in Texas about reopening Texas businesses also in a way that will be safe for that economic revitalization. We will focus on protecting lives while restoring livelihoods. We can and we must do this. So we, can, we can do both. Abbott said that he would provide specifics of the plan next week. He didn't give many details today, but he did say that his plan includes testing and giving people or getting people back to work.
Check out live cam tonight. 70 degrees outside. The cooler Ooh. weather was refreshing. Oh, yeah, definitely refreshing. Like my dog absolutely loved it going outside. Didn't want to come back in. <laughs> <laughs> well, sounds about right out of day like today after the doggone good weather. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say what you did there. <laughs> um, and considering it wasn't quite as humid as what we had the past couple of days. And as we go into this upcoming weekend, we will have some decent weather, I think, especially for most of Easter Sunday. So we'll jump into the forecast, but I mentioned this earlier and you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was showing you images from Europe, images from satellites that is over Europe that were taking measurements of nitrogen dioxide in the air, comparing them from pre shutdown days to after the shutdown. And now we finally have some info for at least one part of the United States. This is all we have thus far from NASA, and that's the northeastern US, basically the I-95 corridor, DC, all the way up to Philly, New York, and Boston. So this is the average nitrogen dioxide, which is a pollutant caused by basically industry, power plants, cars, trucks, everything out there, anything that burns fossil fuels. This is the average for March, taken from 2015 to 2019, okay? Now let's compare that to March 2020 with the shutdown, and you'll see a big difference this past March compared to what your typical March is. Now, there's a lot of caveats that go with me measuring the nitrogen dioxide level, but seeing such a stark difference, I think, does indicate and actually show that there was a marked drop, and NASA's estimating about a 30% decrease in the nitrogen dioxide level. So hopefully that translates to something positive climatologically, but it's way too early to make any conclusions with that. All right, looking at the radar. There's that downpour and little thunderstorm that developed in Mexico earlier this evening, passed just north of Del Rio, fell apart. We still could see a few thunderstorms develop overnight tonight, but I think the odds are starting to drop off with that. Here's our overall weather pattern. The heaviest of the action was in West Texas today. We still have this big upper level disturbance over Southern California. That's going to be the main player tomorrow night into early Sunday morning. As for tonight, here's our future cast, and it does indicate some development out west that would fall apart as it hits San Antonio tonight. I think there's still a shot at a few thunderstorms here and there in the pre dawn hours tomorrow, but chances are dwindling with basically every passing hour. We don't see development out west throughout the day tomorrow. Just fine. Isolated shower, maybe an isolated pop up thunderstorm. Nothing widespread until tomorrow night. That's when we're seeing more favorable conditions for development west of San Antonio around midnight Sunday and then tracking eastward as a more organized system as we get into very early Sunday morning in the pre dawn hours that has a bigger chance of becoming strong to severe. So we could have some pockets of hail with that situation and maybe some isolated areas of gusty winds. 70 right now, you look across the state, we're in the 60s to right near 70 degrees. Same story across South Texas, 60s to near 70. And temperatures are going to take a big dive. We'll make it into the 80s this weekend, but then down into the 60s next week. So here we go, 65 in the morning tomorrow, 80 in the afternoon, that 20% chance for most of the day. Then we get into Easter, 4 a.m., some scattered storms across South Texas, some of which could become strong to severe. But by 9 a.m., I think even 8 a.m., bright sunshine. It's going to, by and large, be a sunny day on Easter, but gusty. West wind at 10 to 25, high temperature into the 80s. Then we look ahead into next week. I mentioned that nosedive in temperatures, and there it is. We're looking at highs in the 60s and mornings in the 40s. Whew, big difference. Thinking about Sunday and Easter, you know, fun fact about the way my little brain works. For the longest time as a child, I thought rabbits laid eggs. Yeah. Did you ever get Easter that confused? Bunny. Exactly. Yeah, and I was I like, it. what in the I world? I can see how you could think that when you were a kid. <laughs> it was only for a hot second, yeah. though, so yeah. I don't think that right. now. Okay. <laughs> Important clarification there. Yeah, Greg, I think, I think Tim Duncan has the right idea here. These could be fashion statements. They could be advertisements. Yeah, you know, that's a great, just kind of a, a roving billboard, if you will. Yeah. In this particular case, I think he's also leading by example. When we come back, we'll show you how Tim Duncan is doing his part by helping prevent the spread of the coronavirus and the XFL folds. Coming up. 
Hall of Famer Tim Duncan is doing his part to prevent the spread of the coronavirus with this post on Instagram today. It shows a five-time NBA champion wearing a mask promoting his blackjack speed shop while in his car. Social media posting goes along with a statement from Tim that says, everyone, please make sure to wear a mask or some kind of facial protection as we all can all make a difference in the fight against COVID-19. Duncan was one of nine basketball greats who were announced as a class of 2020 for the Naismith Hall of Fame last weekend, scheduled to be inducted in Springfield on August the 29th. While the NBA continues its shutdown with no formal decision about a restart set before May 1st, teams are urging Commissioner Adam Silver to delay the NBA draft. Right now, set for June the 25th, teams are urging Silver to delay the draft until at least August the 1st. That gives front office staff time in case the season is restarted next month with a projected completion in late July or early August. NBA players will receive their full paychecks when the next payday arrives on April 15th, even though no gains have been played for more than a month. That's according to a memo sent to all NBA teams this week. Even though as many as 259 games have been put on hold through April 15th since the league suspended operations back on March the 11th when Rudy Gorbert tested positive for the coronavirus. The Spurs are supposed to host the Philadelphia 76ers tonight at home on Good Friday before facing the Houston Rockets on Easter Sunday here in San Antonio. Tonight was supposed to mark one of the Spurs' three final home games of the regular season with four total left before the playoffs were set to begin. Since the league suspended operations last month, the Spurs have had a total of 19 games postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but their last game March the 10th against Dallas that resulted in a 119-109 victory. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Say goodbye to the XFL again. Today, the league laid off all of its employees except for a few members of the executive staff with no plans to return in 2021. That's according to ESPN. After the XFL suspended operations just five games into their season due to the coronavirus, the XFL was owned by WWE chairman Vince McMahon. It was making his second attempt into professional football since 2001 until today's conference call by CEO Jeffrey Pollack. Today's shutdown comes on the heels of the failure of the Alliance of American Football in 2019 that featured the San Antonio Commanders. The Houston Texans have acquired wide receiver Brandon Cooks and a fourth-round draft pick in exchange for a second-round pick from the Texans. The trade is to try and help Houston replace DeAndre Hopkins, who was surprisingly traded to the Arizona Cardinals last month for running back David Johnson and two draft picks, which was one, one was not a first rounder. Cooks played last two seasons with the Los Angeles Rams, who gave him an $81 million contract extension through 2023, helping lead the Rams to the 2018 NFC Championship with over 1,200 yards receiving. The last season, he had a career low 583 yards while battling concussions, giving more playing time to San Antonio's own Josh Reynolds. Cooks now joins Todd Gurley as part of the Rams' offseason purge. After losing Robert Quinn to free agency, the Dallas Cowboys spent the offseason signing veterans Daryl McCoy, Don Terry Poe and Alden Smith to beef up the Dallas D. McCoy and Poe on the defensive line. Smith have reinstated at linebacker. And while Tyrone Crawford looks to return from surgery on both hips after missing most of last season, he knows all three will be ready to contribute. I know we definitely just got three beasts. Um, you know, I don't, I haven't touched base with them yet, but, um, you know, I know the players they are and I know what they can do. And uh, so, yeah, we got some, we got some animals that we just signed. So luck to have them. And yeah, man, this D-line should be pretty scary. All right, the NFL is changing the pass interference rule again. <laughs> Stay tuned next. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL Competition Committee has decided not to endorse a renewal of the replay review for pass interference calls, meaning it could return to the rules it had in place. It was part of that controversial 2018 NFC Championship game that that's when most of us felt the New Orleans Saints were robbed of a trip to the Super Bowl because of an obvious pass interference penalty was not called. The committee also doesn't appear to be too excited over a couple of teams' proposal for a so-called sky judge that we use in the short-lived Alliance of American Football and the XFL. The owners who usually accept the committee's recommendations are scheduled to meet in California next month. What is it with Monday Night Football at one time thought to be the jewel of the NFL broadcast now can't seem to attract any big names. The most recent Drew Brees who's agreed to join NBC Sports as a football analyst when his playing days are over. That's according to the New York Post. Brees who is now 41 years old still plans to play this coming season after signing a two-year $50 million contract extension last month. According to the Post article Brees will be groomed to eventually replace Chris Collinsworth as the lead analyst on the Sunday Night Football broadcast beginning
beginning first as an analyst for Notre Dame football games on NBC and then as a studio host for Football Night in America. ESPN had plans to go after Breeze after his playing days were over to jump into the Monday Night Football broadcast booth. But now Breeze joins Tony Romo, Peyton Manning, and Al Michaels is turning down ESPN, leaving the cable network to consider moving their star college football team of Kurt Herbstreet and Chris Fowler to the NFL broadcast. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. You can see those two doing a Saturday game along with game day and then flying to the next assignment, which would be a Monday? Monday night football game. Yeah, I guess it's possible. It could happen, so we'll wait and see. All right. Thank you, Greg. Sure. Up next, your questions answered. How more vulnerable communities in San Antonio could be impacted by the pandemic? <laughs> Could the cases be leveling off as the coronavirus continues to spread in the United States? There are some indicators showing that that could be happening, but as Marcin Gonzalez reports, it's not time to just relax. Signs of hope in the battle against COVID-19. Doctors on the National Coronavirus Task Force saying for the first time since the pandemic began, the number of cases in the U.S. may be leveling off. But as encouraging as they are, we have not reached the peak. And so every day we need to continue to do what we did yesterday and the week before and the week before that. In New York, the rate of hospitalizations down and more people are now leaving intensive care than going in. Experts say that shows that social distancing is working. This is not the time to feel that since we have made such important advance in the sense of success of the mitigation that we need to be pulling back. But concern is rising in some parts of the country, including Michigan. Our most vulnerable citizens um, are dying in a helpless uh, manner. And Maryland, where the governor warns they're now seeing an increase in new cases. This is going to be one of our most dangerous times ever this weekend and over the next week or so. With millions across the country out of work, many waiting in long lines for food. They have enough food here for 20,000 individuals. President Trump announcing he's creating a task force to decide how to get Americans back to work. Some raising concerns, though, about the country reopening too soon. This is by far the biggest decision of my life because I have to say, OK, let's go. This is what we're going to do. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying widespread antibody testing will be key. Within a period of a week or so, we're going to have a rather large number of tests that are available. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News. News, Los Angeles. There is so much information out there about coronavirus and COVID-19, and not all of it is necessarily true or factual. So we're going to try to separate the facts from the fear. It's something we call coronavirus Q&A, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Lisa Ochoa. She's a vascular surgeon in our community, and she deals with vulnerable communities, I guess you would say, and vulnerable populations. And you have been a big you have been a big voice for uh, medical inequities that you see in our community. Does that carry over to what you're seeing with coronavirus and COVID-19? The populations that have health inequities, which is our south side, our west side and east side, already have multiple barriers um, as, that lead them to worsen healthcare outcomes. So those are lack of transportation, lack of access to health care, health literacy, uh, infrastructure in their neighborhoods. And so, yes, I, these populations who also suffer more uh, comorbidities or medical uh, issues such as diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, all the risk factors that we know that uh, put a COVID patient at higher risk for complications and maybe death. And so already with the barriers they have and with the risk factors they have, uh, I, it makes me concerned uh, to make sure that we protect this vulnerable community. These are not, and these are not just statistics for you. I mean, these are your patients. I mean, you work in these communities, correct? Correct. I have uh, five clinics in San Antonio, uh, focused in the zip codes in San Antonio. And so the healthcare outcome I, follow our diabetic amputations. And so I have clinics in those zip codes with the highest diabetic amputation rates. 
Yeah, which feeds into you being a vascular surgeon. That's what you obviously keep track of. What are you doing to try to help some of your vulnerable patients with through this COVID-19 and, cardi and coronavirus concern? I think the first thing I'm trying to do is making sure that I reach out to all my patients and let them know that we are still here and we are open to take care of their serious needs. Uh, we assure them that we are taking all the sanitary protocols that when they come in, if they're worried about a wound that's not healing or an infection that may be spreading or more pain that, that has been sudden onset, that they can come to the clinic and be seen in person and needed in a very safe manner. I also have noticed patients who just are fearful because they don't want to leave their protected home because of the fear and the anxiety of the COVID crisis. And so we reach out to those and offer them uh, telemedicine visits, which was a quick transition for my clinic. We offer them just telephone calls because sometimes they just want to ask them questions. We actually offer them also to send in pictures of any wounds or um, swelling, whatever they have, so that we use any avenue that they are willing to communicate with us and I want to communicate with them be able to make sure they get taken care of. Is that is that one of your biggest concerns in this whole thing that the fear of getting COVID-19 or the coronavirus is keeping people who should see a doctor away because I talked to an emergency room doctor who works at Methodist Hospital and he says they're not seeing the volume they should see. He said they went two days without seeing anybody that suffered from cardiac arrest and that's very unusual for them. Are, is that your greatest concern as well? You are correct. Uh, I can tell you a lot of the patients I've spoken to have be, are, are fearful to even come into my kind of controlled environment of my clinic. The other thing is a lot of primary care doctors and other specialists have closed their clinics and doing only telemedicine or limited hours. And so these populations, communities that already had so many barriers are now even more burdened and have to overcome more hurdles to get the access to care. And so I think making sure that we let our patients know if they need help, we are still here. There are doctors that are still here to see them and will do so in the safest way possible. Because for some of these vulnerable communities, telemedicine isn't necessarily an option, correct? You're correct. I've run into some uh, hurdles with patients when we try to do telemedicine. For example, some of my patients have flip phones, and so they can't uh, get on video with their flip phones, or they have prepaid phones that don't have enough minutes to be able to, to video chat. And some of them just don't have the social uh, media skills to be able to do that. And so what we've tried to make sure is that we vary uh, what we offer them to what their needs are. If it's a telephone call, if it is at a nursing home, we have the nurses use their phones to help us video chat with our nursing home patients so they don't have to come to us. If it is they want to send me a picture of what their wound looks like on a weekly basis so I'm monitoring them, then we offer them whatever uh, meets their needs. Are you concerned that we're not seeing a complete picture from Metro Health when we see who's contracted and what zip codes and what demographics in San Antonio, because a lot of the people that you're describing in these vulnerable communities might not necessarily get tested or have medical access to get a test. You're correct. I mean, even now in the city, I know early we had limited testing, and even though this expanded, uh, we still have limited testing even in the hospitals. So I think once we're able to expand that testing, we're gonna get a better idea. But like you mentioned, our already vulnerable population, I've actually had some patients call and they say, well, I have a fever and a cough, and they don't know that they have the option to call the hotline to get tested, possibly at the Freeman Coliseum. They're just not, they don't have the health literacy. They don't know that what their options are if they are suffering some of the uh, concerning symptoms for a COVID infection. What can the average San Antonian do to help? help these communities, help these people that, that need access to uh, some of these services? Well, there are several nonprofits and even for-profits uh, in town that have really pivoted to focus on these vulnerable populations. And I know you've uh, interviewed uh, people with a food bank and they're doing a fantastic job. And I think donating to them is great. There's also some smaller businesses. Uh, for example, uh, Folklore's Coffee Shop on the South Side. They have pivoted their business to take in donations and are delivering dry goods, uh, fresh fruit. And we've donated some toiletries to those uh, communities who 
cannot leave their home or maybe quarantine or don't have transportation and don't have access to basic needs like food and toiletries. And so look for those people who are helping. And if it's a financial donation, I know uh, these delivery places need drivers. If you're available to help deliver to these communities, I think that'd be uh, very, very helpful. I want to give you the final word tonight in this interview. What is the one message that you would like to get across to our viewers? My message would be to make sure that everybody knows that if they still need health care, if they still have acute medical issues, whether it's acute asthma or foot wounds like I take care of, that there are doctors out there that can still see you and see you in a safe way. And please reach out to us or reach to, out to anyone who you think um, needs help. Let the, encourage them to seek medical help. The last thing we would want is to delay care for these acute medical issues and they end up in the hospital anyway. Dr. Lisa Ochoa, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. County parks are closed and city parks are set to officially shut down in a little more than an hour. Now, these areas will be off limits for the Easter weekend. That means the tradition of camping will not be happening this year. It's all in an effort to keep this virus from spreading. Trails will be open, but only for walking, running or biking. And the parks are set up to open on Monday morning. The city of San Antonio also putting out these reminders to encourage social distancing this Easter weekend. Now, while you might want to invite everyone over for the weekend barbecue, you should limit your Easter weekend to spending time with those who live in your household. Remember, the more we all practice social distancing, the more we can help flatten the curve. You know, times have indeed changed. There was no passion play outside San Fernando Cathedral on this Good Friday. Jesse DeGriado shows us how churches are bringing their Easter Sunday services into people's homes through the modern day miracle of technology. A crucifix adorned with fresh flowers towers over the sanctuary at First Baptist Church. At St. Pius X Catholic Church, a camera broadcasts a deacon's sermon as Father Pat O'Brien displays the Stations of the Cross. We're trying to keep, keep the holiness, the solemnity, and truly remember what it is that we're about today. Some 2,000 years ago. Like many churches of all faiths, First Baptist Church has been live streaming its services since the COVID-19 crisis began. We have this wonderful opportunity to, to worship together and, and we need the comfort of worship right now. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even if, he says, it's from a distance, thanks to technology. Perhaps, they say, it'll also bring in people who haven't been to church in a while. Times are much different. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. But they say the message that Easter brings remains unchanged, and yet it's even more meaningful now. No matter where they are, whether watching through live streaming, TV, whatever, their God is still present and coming to them. And God is going to love us through this time uh, of uncertainty and all the pain that, that our people are going through right now. The Lord carried his cross for our salvation. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Love us through this time. I liked what that pastor said there. Oh, yeah. And it is, it is a special time. You know, a lot of people's birthdays, a lot of people's anniversaries, a lot of stuff happening where people are just going to have to find different ways to celebrate. Exactly. And we have one very unique way of celebrating a 10th birthday here in San Antonio, and that is the 10th birthday of Morgan's Wonderland. Take a look at this. They're illuminating their take flight statue with a beacon of hope every evening for the rest of April. Normally they'd be having a big party to celebrate this huge milestone and event. But obviously with the pandemic, that's not possible. So the beacon not only stands for the accomplishments over the past 10 years, but hope for a bright future once we overcome this pandemic. That's what Gordon Hartman said. So something to look for, you know, if you're on yeah. 35, if you're on Wurzbach Parkway, you know, you mm -hmm. should be able to see that beacon every night between now and the end of April, right? A absolutely. So when we have, the, especially when you have the clouds that are low in the sky, you really see the light bounce off those clouds, such as a night like tonight. So if you see that light every night and you're looking up, it's coming from Morgan's Wonderland. Happy 10th birthday. All right, so our drought monitor, I want to point this out. We've had big improvements 
but obviously we could use more rain. There's another shot at it as we get into the weekend next week looking dry. So we've got another opportunity overall though. The state is in pretty good shape. Only 19% of Texas is in drought compared to nearly 40% just three months ago. Fact or just proof right there that we've chipped away at it. So some weekend storms are possible just for parts of the weekend. Most of Sunday on Easter is looking OK, sunny and then much cooler next week. So let's let's talk temperatures today. We only made it into the low to mid 70s and now we're at 70 in San Antonio at the airport. The Randolph 68 Stinson at 69 Bernie stage airfield at 64 Floresville 71 at right around 70 degrees. You get the idea. Look what happens in the days ahead. OK, we make it into the 80s this weekend, but then next week. We're affected by a cold front. A big cold front's going to slam us Sunday night. That's going to really plummet temperatures for next week. So later tonight and very first thing tomorrow morning, we could have a few storms developing across South Texas. Otherwise, a little bit of sunshine Saturday afternoon, a 20% chance of a late day shower storm popping up and will be near 80 Easter Sunday before sunrise. We are expecting some scattered storms to develop across South Texas, and they would have a higher likelihood of becoming strong to severe. But after sunrise, we should really start to clear out and the vast majority of the day actually looking very pleasant. Sunny, low humidity, 82, but gusty. If the Easter Bunny can uh, get his hands on some kites, it'd be a good day for it on Easter Sunday, all right? It's going to be gusty out there with that west wind. Then next week, there's that cooler weather. I mean, get ready for mornings back in the 40s and afternoons in the 60s, which, you know, so often wouldn't be such a big deal. But after we've been in the 90s and 80s, this is going to be a noticeable front next week. Oh, yeah. Should we leave the eggs unpainted? You know, whatever, whatever suits your fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want the dye running off in no, the grass, right. you know. <laughs> represents everything. She's an amazing person. She's an amazing role model. She's an amazing artist. She wasn't able to captivate you when she was singing. Selena's sister speaking about the Queen of Tejano. 25 years after her death, her legacy continues to take hold in the Alamo City. This is just one of the interviews you can expect in KSAT 12's one hour special called Siempre Selena. We hear from former band members, those who followed and knew Selena well, and from current artists and musicians keeping her music alive. The special will air on Sunday night at 9 p.m. right here on KSAT 12. Stick around one doctor's message as we head into the Easter weekend. Your night beat in review is up next. Well, this pandemic is certainly pushing San Antonio to take more precautions. More people are wearing masks and an experimental treatment for the disease is actually underway. And one doctor also leaving us to reflect on the phrase stay home to save lives as we near the Easter holiday. Here's this week's Night Beat in Review. Comes as Mayor Ron Nuremberg says early indications show social distancing is working, but we are not out of the woods yet. Even recommending you wear a mask or face covering when out in public. It can be made out of homemade masks or scarves or bandanas or even a handkerchief. But we have to mention, do not wear medical masks or N95 respirators as they are a needed resource for health care providers and our first responders. 16 at a time, a new rule for via bus riders. This after a bus driver tested positive for COVID-19. Via says once a bus reaches 16 passengers, operators will display a message in the destination sign reading at safe capacity. This is to let others know the bus has reached its maximum load and they should catch the next bus. COVID-19 taking out more jobs and the arts here in San Antonio will certainly suffer. It all goes back to the hotel occupancy tax being decimated. With those funds now cut off, about 270 employees furloughed all worked in city departments that rely on that tax, like the convention center and the Alamo Dome. The furloughs begin April 23rd. They're expected to last through July 31st.
the convalescent plasma. We told you about the first donation of plasma from a COVID-19 patient who recovered. That plasma came from David Herman, who made a donation Tuesday and is set up to offer another donation. This after the donation center announced it would help in the Food and Drug Administration's investigation into antibodies building up in the plasma of recovered COVID-19 patients. Love your family from a distance. That advice coming from the mayor of San Antonio tonight as we head into the holiday weekend. He says you should only gather with members in your household as you celebrate Passover or Easter. Instead, visit virtually with friends or extended family members, whether it's by phone or computer. And they predict that, you know, we, by the first week that we stayed home here in San Antonio, we saved 1,271 lives. Fiesta fans, listen up. We know Fiesta was delayed until November, but KSAT is hoping to give San Antonio a bit of the party with the purpose in their own homes. Check this out. We'll be rebroadcasting last year's Fiesta par par uh, parades on the days that they would have occurred this year, which begins just 10 days from now on April 20th. Now, these are just some of the events that will allow residents to stay home and still enjoy the Fiesta spirit. Did promos for him today the other day I had to get my Fiesta wear out yes. last year. Yeah. What's there to do while spending time at home? Well, one father daughter duo in Tucson, Arizona is starting their own dance party. Bella and Charles Luna are teaching classes online every Saturday. They say the classes are for beginners or advanced levels. They say it's all about helping others. Even ballet dancers in Russia are stuck at home amid the coronavirus pandemic, but members of the St. Petersburg Mikhailovsky Theater decided to put together a show anyway. They posted a video performing alone in their kitchens, living rooms, and gardens, all in sweats and leggings. I like she's cooking dinner. Oh, yeah. Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> that does it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 6 a.m. Good night. Nightline is next. Have a great weekend, everybody.